Good morning. Um, first of all, I want to I want to thank United Waterfowlers for the the wonderful dinner last night. The ribs were awesome. So whoever made them, thank you. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit today about um, statewide assessment plan that we're developing. And we actually started developing um, about five years ago, um, starting with Public Lakes, so we can try to focus our, um, our efforts on where we need to be doing restoration and enhancement. And um, we manage for fish and wildlife resources and habitat, and the human part of that, the stakeholder part of that, is a huge component of what we do. Our executive director takes this very seriously are working with stakeholders to make sure that we're providing good management to the people who use those resources and use good science to make those decisions. Um, okay. um, in Florida, we have, about, we have over three million acres of, of freshwater um, lakes, 12,000 miles of boatable rivers and streams, and over nine million acres of um, freshwater marshes. So, not, although not all of those are in public ownership, um, you can see that tr trying to do aquatic habitat management, aquatic, ha aquatic habitat enhancement can be a daunting task when trying to determine what needs to be done and what people want. Um, as everybody in this room knows, the aquatic resources of Florida have been degraded over time um, through different mechanisms, but primarily through anthropogenic influences that we've had on those resources. Um, urbanization of freshwater systems, um, intensive water management practices, <clears throat> uh, exclusion of natural disturbances such as um, the allowing droughts to be droughts, um, allow, allowing flooding to be flooding, and fire management. Uh, nutrient enrichment is obviously one of the things that for those people in South Florida, you're very aware of um, with what's going on on the east and west coast, but all of these, all of these issues play a role in, in the management that we do and um, the decisions that we make. Um, for the full disclosure, this photo used to be hydrilla, but I didn't think that would play very well with this group, talking about hydrilla as a, a noxious invasive macrophyte. Um, it, what's resulted is we have very few natural systems in Florida. I mean, virtually everywhere that you go, um, the wetlands, the lakes, the river streams have been impacted one way or the other, and because of that, uh, management enhancement is, is typically necessary. Some type of management or enhancement is usually necessary. Um, one of the things we, you talk about when you're learning to be a biologist is um, the idea of tragedy of the commons. Um, with public property, Everybody wants a piece. Everybody believes their, their vision of that public property is most important. How they want to use it is most important. And essentially, even though public property is nobody's property, everybody considers, considers it their, their own property, and they look at it as it's their own property and how, they, and how their uh, use of that property should be given top priority. So um, that's another thing that we have to consider um, when we're doing management. Um, 50 years ago, 40 years ago, maybe even 30 years ago, um, our traditional stakeholders for the agency were, were hunters and fishermen. The whole, the whole book, hook and bullet club, that's what we were called. Nowadays, we're look, when we do management, we have to consider many, many species. And what you end up having is the freshwater sport fish, and the game species tend to get pushed to the side at, at, in, in some instances. So when we're considering management, it is a very holistic approach. And we're, we ended up having to work with a variety of stakeholders, many of them non-traditional. We're working with riparian uh, landowners, we're working with the Corps of Engineers, we're working with duck hunters, we're working with anglers, and just like I talked about before, every one of them consider themselves to be an important stakeholder in the process and that their, their wants and needs need to be considered in developing management plans. Um, 
this is maybe an example of what you might see at a hydrilla meeting on the Kissimmee Chain of Lakes. If you look hard enough, you probably see Dennis and Newton somewhere in that picture. But this is what we're trying to avoid, is that when we go to public meetings, that we are working together with our stakeholders. So when we come out of the meeting, we're shaking hands, patting each other back, saying we have come up with a plan that we're all maybe not completely happy with, but a plan that, that we can all live with. So looking at the state of Florida, we have limited resources. We have a limited number of, of biologists that can do this type of work. We have limited funding to do this type of work. We have lots of water bodies to try to do work on. Um, so what we need to do, what we're trying to do, what we did a few years ago with lake, with public lakes, was trying to come up with a defendable approach of deciding what projects to do and how to spend our money. When we have a legislator come to us and say, why are you working on Lake X? Why are you working on water management Y? Uh, we can provide a, a scientific basis for that work and we can provide a background of stakeholder support for the work that we're doing. So this wetland assessment plan, um, it's it's, it is putting together an analytical approach for a restoration enhancement and management of the water bodies and wetlands of the state of Florida. And again, the important, uh, the important objectives of this, again, is providing stakeholders and our biologists with the best available data to make informed decisions, to develop a, a science-based approach that can be understood not just by scientists, but by the stakeholders that we're, that we're developing these projects with and identifying partnerships that we can, we can form on these public um, sites with other agencies, with NGOs, and stakeholder groups that want to be involved. Uh, the four types of systems that, that we're going to work on, um, that we're trying to identify um, uh, projects, identify sites, are uh, freshwater wetlands non-forested and as, I mean essentially it is what it sounds like they're herbaceous marshes uh, the two primary herbaceous marshes that, that you find in Florida are freshwater marshes and prairies and bogs uh, really the only difference is with freshwater marshes or the bigger differences is you get greater inundation uh, deep and and they tend to be deeper in freshwater marshes and you tend to have taller vegetation and more floating species um, forested wetlands. Um, the two primary types are cypress tupelo swamps and hardwood swamps. Again, the swamp, uh, marshes and swamps dominated by hyd hydrophytic um, trees, and those are uh, those comprise almost four and a half million acres within the state of Florida. And again, not all of it in public ownership, but four and a half million acres that we're looking we're looking to do work on. Streams, rivers, springs. Um, some of the biggest challenges that we face as an agency are on issues that we really have no control over. Um, some of the issues that, that really affect streams and springs are groundwater and surface withdrawal. The art, my agency has no, no um, control over those issues. Um, runoff, agriculture and, and urban runoff, and groundwater contamination. Those are all issues that affect streams and springs that um, although we have a voice in it, we really don't have much control over it. And lakes. Um, like I said, we, we've done this, we've already done a prioritization on, on public lakes. It was the low-hanging fruit um, of the, the four systems. We can identify public lakes pretty easily. Does it have a boat ramp? Are we, can, can our IPM section do work on it? Um, can we do work on it? It has to be a public water body. Um, and I can take no credit for the development of the GIS and, uh, methodology. Jennifer Bach and Jessica Griffith developed the, this, this process, but essentially um, what they did is they did a literature review for available GIS layers that can be used for this type of analysis. Um, 
they talked to subject matter ex experts to determine what data layers would be applicable to this type of, of, this type of assessment. Um, criteria for inclusion, it had to be mission-based. Ha it had to be something that we could do. Um, it had to be something that was applicable to what we do. Um, again, I keep saying this over and over again. Not only does it have to be public lands, there has to be public access. One of the big issues I hear from different stakeholder groups is state of Florida, Water Management District, uh, the service owns all this public lands and we have no access to it. Well, although we will identify within this assessment where private and public ownership lands are and where you have public lands, we will be focusing this assessment on those lands that have public access. Um, again, our categories um, and, and the parameters that we're going to use have to be mission driven. We have to have something that, that the, our agency can, can work on. Um, the, the, categories, the categories that we're going to work on, and those are the larger, the larger groups that we're going to concentrate our effort, um, are socioeconomic. Um, we, ha we want to identify those habitats that we're going to get that our stakeholders are going to get benefit from. They're going to get a recreational, an aesthetic, an educational, a commercial benefit from the resources on which we work. Um, fish and wildlife populations, that seems like a no-brainer. We want to look for those habitats, those, those management opportunities that provide the greatest quantity and quality of habitat to support our fish and wildlife populations. Um, and then management emphasis. And, this is one of the ones that, we've, that we debate every time that we do an assessment. Um, we're looking at um, habitats that we can increase the potential for enhancement, and those are resources that are, that are altered by hydrologic modification, changes in land use, biological disturbances, and depending on how you want to look at it, you can look at those those parameters in a negative or positive way. And I'll talk a little bit about that when we get to that, that category. Scoring, pretty straightforward. Each one of the parameters that we're gonna look at, we're gonna look at 13 different parameters, will be scored on a zero to one basis. The different ways of doing that, some will be binary, where if it's, a, if it's present, it gets a, a one, if it's absent, it gets a zero. It may be buffer-based, where Within an area, if you have a certain amount of this, this type of wetland habitat or you have this amount of buffer, then you get a percentage of that one point. You may have weighted ranges. Um, you may be looking at uh, tiny species is one of the criteria that we're looking at. And you have, may have some, some sites that have lots of tiny species. You have some that may have very few. You have some that are in the middle. And we would assign a, a score between zero and one um, that will address those levels of, of um, species that are on those properties. And then coming up with priority levels, you know, low, medium, high, low, uh, medium, low, medium, high, those types of things. And using a jinx analysis, which all it is is, is looks at the data, looks at the groups, and, and um, forms natural groups so we can identify high and low priority areas. Um, our socioeconomic important parameters we're going to look at are public access points. On those areas that are, that are public, how available are they are to people? On a, a, river and, a river or a lake, it's the number of boat ramps. On, a, on a, a site that has wetlands, and when I talk about sites that have wetlands, I'm not talking about each individual wetland. I'm talking about WMAs. I'm talking about the conservation areas. I'm talking about the STAs. I'm talking about uh, parks that are available and the um, the avail in how available those parks are. If a, if a park is only open two days a week, it's going to get a lower score than a park that is available uh, seven days a week, 24 hours a day. Recreational trails. Again, this is one of the, this is one of the ones we're going to use buffers on. The amount of tra recreational trails within a, within a site um, or the amount of recreational trails that are within a buffer for a, for a lake or a river. Uh, population, 50 miles, and this is one of the ones that we, we really debated. The closer a, a site is to a major um, population center, we're giving that a higher score. That is a site that is more likely to be used 
by our stakeholders than a site that's out in the middle of, any, of nowhere. And part of the discussion was, well, maybe you should be ranking those low, lower, but this is a socioeconomic parameter. We're looking at those sites that are close to where people can use them. And fishing and hunting opportunities. Again, people comment all the time, well, I, I want an opportunity to either fish, hunt, some type of consumptive use. And even though non-consumptive use, um, just boating, uh, bird watching, are important, um, we want to identify those sites that allow hunting and fishing opportunities. Fish and, wild, fish and wildlife populations. Um, the size of the water body, the size of the park, the size of the WMA are important in how those sites are used by different fish and wildlife species. The size of the wetland, the size of the, of, um, the, size of the wetlands within that, that site are important in how fish and wildlife can use those, those sites. So the larger the area, the larger the wetlands, the greater the percentage of the area that is in wetlands, the more important it is. Um, looking at um, avian focus areas, um, waterfowl, water birds, shorebirds, land birds, um, and seabirds. All are, um, all we have developed or have, there have been focus areas developed for, for each one of those species groups. And the, if an area is within one or more of those focus groups, it gets a score. Um, and then t threatened and endangered um, SGCN species. There are 141 species that have been identified through our um, um, state action plan, our legacy action plan. And the more of those species that are present within a site, and they include, I mean, mammals, mussel snails, insects, um, all, all of those species will be considered in the analysis. Um, again, playing to my audience, um, the, the waterfowl focus areas. Essentially, if one of the wetlands falls within one of these sites, it will get a score. So, as my section leader, he insisted that I included this one especially. Um, but, I mean, the, we use this with the lake analysis. It is, it is important. People recognize the importance of um, the water bodies within these focus areas and how, and how our stakeholders use them and man management emphasis. And then, again, this is the one that's a little bit tricky, a little bit controversial, because we're looking at invasive category one plants that are, that are on a site. We're looking at the hydrologic alterations. We're looking at um, if an area has a, a riparian buffer, a freshwater buffer, and um, impaired waters, road density, how, you know, how many roads, how dense are the roads around an area. And you can look at this from two perspectives. Um, a couple of years ago, our legacy folks did an analysis, and they considered that if these scores are, are high, those are areas that need enhancement. If these scores are low, those are areas that, that deserve preservation. We don't necessarily need to be going in and doing enhancement. We need to be going in and, and looking the, uh, at, at buying up lands or preserving those areas so you don't have these impacts on the lands. From our perspective for this analysis, because it's an enhancement and restoration analysis, we're looking at the more invasive plants, the higher the score. The more roads around an area, the higher the score. So each one of these five will be considered in, the, in, in our analysis. Um, just an example, throwing numbers out there. Um, essentially, it is, gets a score between zero and one, um, it provides you an opportunity if, if what you're interested in is the value of those wetlands, those water bodies from a socioeconomic um, standpoint, it, it will provide us the ability to provide that assessment for each one of these categories. But it will also allow us to provide an overall score that you can say within this area, within this region of the state, within the state of Florida, these are the, these are the wetlands, these are the water bodies on which we need to be concentrating our efforts. Um, for this assessment, though, the direction that we are uh, considering going is looking only on a regional scale. We are trying to develop, or in the process of developing, regional management teams. And the reason that we want to do this, especially for wetlands, is because when you, as you go through the state, you have different types of wetlands, you have different 
um, impacts on those wetlands. So in trying to, trying to compare a wetland in South Florida to a wetland in Northwest Florida, look on a regional basis and have our teams come up with the projects that need to be done and then get those projects vetted through our stakeholders. Um, we, we, did the, we did a lake assessment in 2012. Again, looking at only at public lakes, we identified 324 public lakes in the state of Florida um, and only looked at lakes over 50 acres. Um, looking at lakes that, that we felt had the opportunity for some type of enhancement opportunities. And 14 lakes popped up to the top. None of them are surprises. The Kissimmee Chain, Lake Okeechobee, Lake Estepoga, Orange Lake, those big resources that everybody knows are important to the state of Florida. And if you look at, if you look at it for each category, from socioeconomic, fish and wildlife, five of those popped to the top. They, all, they show up on all three levels as high priority. Again, no brainer here. The Kissimmee Chain, specifically Toho and Kissimmee. Lake Estepoga, Lake Okeechobee, and Orange Lake. Surprisingly enough, those are the water bodies on which we have working groups. We have working groups dedicated towards those resources and stakeholder groups dedicated towards those resources. Um, as an just a quick example, um, this is a, a, a regional map, a lake map, um, showing the priorities within the Northeast region. We're in the Northeast region, so most people are familiar with these water bodies. But, you know, they, they show up as the Kissimmee Chain, they show up as Panasofsky, they show up as, as Orange Lake, and that's very different than the South region. When you look at the South region, you have Lake Okeechobee, you have Trafford, you got the Osborne Chain over here, but you don't have very many public lakes in South Florida. But what do you have in South Florida that's unique? You have the Everglades, you have the conservation areas, you have the RWMAs that take up millions of acres. That hundreds of thousands of acres in South Florida that are important to our stakeholders. And not only our fish and wildlife stakeholders, but those people that want water, those people that don't want water, and those people that want to live in South Florida. Um, so in our process, and this is in our process in general anyway, is once we've done this assessment plan, it will give our regional teams the opportunity to sit down, look at those resources that we need to be working on and, and identify projects that we need to be doing. It'll provide our staff, our area staff, our IPM staff, the opportunity to, then to develop projects on those recommendations. Those recommendations will be, t will be taken to our ex the external agencies, our, our uh, specific stakeholders. United Waterfowlers is one of our most important stakeholder groups. And once we've developed the plan, we've gotten comments on it from our most important stakeholders, then we go through a public meeting process. Once we've done that, then we apply for funding, then we implement the project. So there is a process that we are developing. There's a reason why this wetland assessment plan is vital to the, the future manager in the state of Florida. Thank you very much. Is your, uh, uh, I should understand your focus on areas that currently have public access. Are you identifying areas that need public access and are you putting resources and advocacy in getting that public access? Um, it, that is an important secondary component of this process. I mean, there, we could identify private lands. Um, as many of y'all know, um, one of our senators just proposed buying 60,000 acres in the Everglades and coming up with $1.2 billion to do that. Well, that's private lands. Those may be sites that would be identified through this process that could be used, but our focus our primary focus is trying to identify what restoration and enhancement opportunities we have, but it could be used. It could be used for private lands to identify important private lands. It could be it could be used to identify public lands that that need access, or we would like to see more access or access. Period. Long answer to short short question. I know. Yes, sir.
Mm -hmm. does, does that property get then? Does it get put ahead on the next evaluation? Does it get looked at um, as it was closed, or you know something else comes in? in does it keep getting bumped? No, th there is no bumping. It, again, we're we're trying to identify where we need to be focusing our effort. It doesn't mean that we. We will only work on those highest priority areas. There are a number of, of lakes in the state of Florida that are bottom of the list. Out of 324, there are 300 on the list. But because those resources are important to that region or maybe important to a stakeholder group, we will do projects on those resources. So it's, it's, it's more to allow us to focus effort, to identify where we need to be working it's not an exclusive list. It's not gonna, we're not intending to say you can only work on the highest priority uh, uh, systems. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm blinded by this light. Input. Where are you in that process as far as, I know the lakes you pretty well have finished, but on the wetland aspect, did I hear where, I know you are spending a lot of time on it, but um, when do you think you'll have some kind of priority? When I leave this, this meeting, we are, I'm starting to work with Jennifer next week on putting together the, the um, analysis. So the plan is to have a um, a plan in place next spring. Now again, I, when, I, when we say assessment plan, I mean, we're, we're not talking about management plans here. We're talking about identifying resources and where our, then our stakeholders and our staff can start focusing effort. Um, so, but the plan is to have uh, this, this plan in place next spring. Yes, sir. It, it, it's a living plan. Um, what we originally talked about with the lakes was every five years. Um, but what we're finding with the lakes is um, there, there doesn't, it doesn't change much. That may be different with the wetland analysis, with the, the true wetland and the marsh analysis, because you have data that changes every year. Um, so. I mean, I think we're still looking at a, fi a five-year reevaluation, but um, you know, again, that's just the plan at this point. <laughs>